Hey everyone, welcome to A Great Alternative. Today, month of May, we are here again at Glass Bren to find out what's changed at the agroecological permaculture market garden. But first, I need to do some kind of creative transition from me to Abel. All right, is it gonna go well this time? Seamless. So welcome back to the Poly Tunnel. Uh, it's May. Uh, we just passed May Day a few days ago, also known as Beltane or in Wales here, Calam Mai. Things have changed a lot. You'll notice I'm wearing less clothes. So every month you notice I'm wearing less and less clothes as it gets warmer and warmer in this tunnel. Does that mean in November you're going to be naked? <laughs> <laughs> Silage is going on in the background, so apologize for any tractor sounds. So this month I actually wanted to talk about some of the challenges that we've been having. So we're a community supported agriculture project or a community food project and a big part of what we do, a big pillar of the project is um, transparency. So being really open and honest about the realities of farming and food growing for our members and supporters in a way to kind of bring people closer to where their food comes from and really understand what it takes to bring the food that's on their plate from the seed to the point where they're eating it. And so part of that is just to be really yeah, open about the hard times in farming and we've had, well I've had a really kind of hard few weeks on the farm here. If you look at our Instagram and you look at the website and YouTube videos like this, um, it can seem like this is all, you know, a bright and sunny and, and wonderful abundant life. And it is, and we're really privileged to live this way and I feel very lucky to do that. But there are times of the year that are really hard and particularly the last couple of months for me because my co-grower, Stefan, who's been with me for four years, we've been growing together here on this site for four years. We've developed it together through the pandemic, through some really intense times he had to move on to another job so I've been kind of yeah adjusting to that and noticing how yeah how much harder it is to do it on my own and not just from the workload but it's also thinking about all the different details of growing the business the organizational stuff and also just the moral support you know we were really good friends we developed a really close amazing kind of symphony of a, of a working relationship over those years and and being without him to talk things through and to, to you know bounce ideas off has been really hard and yeah, and he's like a brother to me, so not having him around is, is a really big adjustment. Uh, at the same time, um, there's this general sense of like the wind going out of the sails a bit of the of the good ship Glass Bren. It feels a bit like, I don't know whether it's the times that we're going through with everybody being in such economic difficulties and, and the challenges that, that we're all facing at the moment. Just generally folks are a little less, less engaged or a little, you know, we haven't had a lot of volunteers and, and it's been harder to sell veg boxes and things like that. So um, yeah, I'm just feeling a bit of the wind going out the sails and I'm sure that's temporary um, but that can be hard for motivation as well as a, as a grower when you're entering the busiest time which April and May is a really crazy time like it's really there's thousands of plants that need to go out into the ground and there's potentially weather challenges there's just a lot to do and a lot to be on top of and obviously the weeds are all growing and everything's growing at a super fast rate so those are just some of the things we're contending with the blessing is that I look back at our newsletters from this time last year uh, and this time last year we were in a drought so the blessing is we've had plenty of rain. There's been loads of rain, mix of sun and rain, which is perfect for growing. So yeah, as always with farming, there's, there's the two sides of the coin. But this month we're gonna talk about planting because this is such a key time for getting all those plants that we'd be nurturing in the seed house out into the ground, whether it's in the polytunnel or out into the, the garden. So we're gonna talk about planting, we're gonna talk about intercropping. So planting things together for different reasons and the different reasons why we want, want to create relationships between different plants. We're gonna um, do some planting ourselves and we're also gonna answer some of your questions that you've posted on YouTube or Instagram. I'm gonna try and get to some of your questions as well. So it's gonna be a busy month. May is a really busy time. So this is gonna be quite a full video, but um, yeah, with no further ado, let's get going. You probably notice between April and May the biggest kind of change in the garden and in what we're doing because everything's transitioning over from uh, leftover winter crops and spring crops over to summer crops. So in the tunnels we've got loads of sweet corn and beans and squash waiting to go out. We'll see this tunnel completely change over the next few weeks as these spring cabbages, we finish all of these. Some of these are going to go to a community canteen in Carmarthen. We're going to sell some of them and then these beds are all going to be turned over for the tomatoes. So there's going to be something like 240 tomato plants coming in here. All our French beans are gonna be coming up over here. As you can see, things are starting to go to seed that have been in here through the winter, so they're all gonna come out. We'll change that over to French beans. We'll be getting our aubergines in, our cucumbers. We feel brave enough now to start planting some things outside. So we've got broad beans going, we've got uh, chard and beetroot and turnips 
but we're kind of wary of getting some of those summer crops out quite yet because we can still have frost at this time of year. We've had frost as late as early June, so things like beans and sweet corn and squash, they're going to stay in the seed house for a little bit longer until we feel safe enough to get them outside uh, that they're not going to get frost damaged. It's getting pretty hot in here. Jason, I've got an idea. Let's bring the rain. <laughs> so something that we're really interested in here at Glassbrenn and we try to do as much as possible throughout our planting plan and the way that we get plants in the ground is something called intercropping. Now this is the act simply of growing things in relationship with each other based on uh, the nature of the plant, the characteristics of the plant, uh, maybe the height or size of the plant, um, or its soil needs and cropping characteristics. So for example, in this bed here, we've got, I'm trying a new intercropping method this year with our Cobra French bean. So instead of having one crop like a French bean, which takes a really long time to produce, you know, in comparative terms, take, you know, these plants have got to grow up their strings, but while they grow, there's loads of space underneath these plants that we could be using to grow other things. Hence kind of increasing the amount of food we're able to produce from each kind of square meter of, of bed that we have. So what I did was I planted in some spring onions on the outside here. So making use of the edges of the beds. Uh, it's really key making space for these fertile edges where the path meets the bed. Um, so we've got some spring onions there, which are fairly crop, quick to crop. And then stepping in, we've got our lines of French beans, which were direct sown. These are a Cobra French bean that we've been saving the seed of for a few years now. Um, and then in between the two rows of French beans, we've put in what's called a catch crop of lettuce. So a catch crop is where you put in a really quick cropping vegetable something that doesn't take very long to grow in space that will ultimately be filled in with other crops. And this is something that you can, you can translate um, to many different crops. You know, for example, a lot of those big brassicas like your broccolis, your Brussels sprouts, your cauliflowers, they're really slow to grow and take up a lot of space. So really you want to make use of, of all that space around them whilst they're growing and once they're, once they're fully grown because they cast a nice bit of shade for shade tolerant crops like carrots, for example. So yeah, you can really think creatively about what you can use that space in between for. Um, and there's lots of resources out there that you can check out to kind of give you senses of which, which plants work well together, which, which vegetables like to grow next to each other, which ones don't. Another classic would be that we'll be growing basil in the shade of our tomatoes here. So all the, all the, all the kind of space around the bottom of the tomatoes will have basil. A classic companion planting method is the three sisters you might have heard of, which is when sweet corn, squash, and beans are grown together in relationship. Um, and that has a really functional reason, which is that the corn provides a pole for the beans to climb up. The beans fix nitrogen, which feeds the corn and the squash. Uh, and the squash creates a really nice ground cover, keeping the soil moist and damp, uh, keeping the weeds at bay. And you've got three vegetables coming out from a space that you might otherwise only get one vegetable from. So it's got all those extra benefits of fertility building, increasing your productivity and abundance. Yeah, and reducing your weed pressure, reducing the work, keeping water in the ground um, and creating more diversity as well. And you might want to throw in there some you know, biodiversity loving, loving plants for pollinators like flowers, sunflowers, calendula, things like that. Um, just to kind of build on those guilds of plants in relationship with each other that serve all these multiple different functions. That's really how we want to be thinking when we're creating a truly kind of permacultural, diverse, uh, regenerative food growing landscape. So we made really good progress with the help of my family uh, planting the patty pan squash. So that's the summer squash that looks a bit like a, a UFO alien spaceship. A really cool vegetable to have in summertime. Um, and we're moving on now to finishing up these turnips. So we talked earlier in the year uh, when we we're talking about seed propagation about how the fact that we do a lot of our plants from seed. So we grow them as plugs. So this is what's called a plug. This has been grown in a plug tray. Um, Particularly we do this with things like turnips, beetroot, spring onions, um, the kind of successional crops that we grow. Um, and what we're doing right now is we're just quickly popping them in. Um, it's a really quick process. It doesn't need to be particularly finessed. You just need to get your spacing right. Just giving it a little pop into the ground, a little push down, help it bed in. But really it's not, a, it's not an exact thing. 
and really the plants will do their own thing, spread their roots. So we do a mixture of different planting styles. Obviously you can see here, this bed is gonna be entirely uh, turnips. This bed here is entirely broad beans. Um, sometimes we grow things, as I talked about earlier, in amongst them in an intercropping sort of way. And then otherwise the areas in and around the beds will be kind of filled with flowers, with pollinating plants. Uh, there's so many different reasons to think about uh, a mixture and diversity of plants in your garden. Obviously productivity and, and, and yield is one of them, a big one, for, especially when it's a market garden, if you're trying to produce as much food as you can from um, a small amount of space like we are. But also there's so many other reasons like, yeah, encouraging pollinators into the garden, encouraging those insects that are going to help pollinate your vegetable plants. Um, so lots of those the flowers like borage, comfrey is great for that, calendula, all these kind of things that we bring in to attract the pollinators. Otherwise we have our mineral accumulators, so we have our plants that dig really deep down with their roots and bring up those micronutrients that we really want in our compost. And our compost teas like comfrey is a great one, so we can use what's available in the leaf of comfrey to create these really nutrient dense, highly uh, fertile uh, fertilizers and compost. Other reasons are for ground cover, so if we want to cover the ground so that it doesn't grow into weeds or plants that we don't want, that's another, another reason. Green manures, so green manures are a sort of cover crop that will fix nitrogen, make that nitrogen available um, to the plants. Something we do, for example, is we'll, once we've planted our sweet corn plants that we have in the seed house waiting to go out, uh, we'll sow a green manure like yellow trefoil, something like that, maybe some white clover, um, in and around the plants um, to cover the ground, to build, build uh, fertility, um, and yeah, to make sure the ground is covered around these crops that sit there for quite a long time, leaving lots of open ground. So. That's just some of the reasons why we think about um, the plants we're going to plant together, the companionships, the relationships that we have between the plants, which is really important in a, in a, yeah, in a healthy, thriving, diverse garden. And it's often, I often get asked about pests when we're doing tours around the garden or doing courses. And, and my answer to that really often is, is, as long as you have healthy soil and you have plant diversity, that can go a long way to helping fight pests. So there's a lot of plants that are really great for um, deterring pests or distracting pests. So nasturtiums is a classic one. Um, a lot of people know that's that's good for distracting cabbage white butterfly, which likes to lay its eggs on, on the brassicas. So there's lots of plants out there that can sort of, maybe their scent distracts plants like onions, alliums are really good for sort of distracting pests from other plants. Um, some plants distract and, and sort of act as like a sacrificial plant. Um, you can do things like allow your brassica plants to flower and that helps to distract pests from your the ones you want to harvest from. So there's um, lots of plants that you can integrate into your system to deter pests, but also yeah, healthy soil and diversity um, of plants is really key. This got inspired by one of our recent followers in one of the past videos that we've done. Um, who asked some questions within the comments of a video and I kind of passed them on to Abel. And I thought it would be a really good idea to add this to every single month's video. So if you're interested, put down in the comments below a question that you'd like me to post to Abel. And then in following months, we're gonna, I'm gonna do a few minutes uh, at the end of each video asking a few of those questions. And then definitely at the end of the year, we're gonna do a much longer um, kind of Q and A session where we go through all these different questions if they haven't necessarily been answered already in the month's video. First question comes from Honeybee Hollow Gardens. Are there any niche vegetables, fruits, nuts, etc., um, that you're finding are growing or selling well? Maybe even mushrooms as well. Mm. Well, because we do, we've, always, we've always distributed our veg, sold our veg through what's called a community supported agriculture scheme. So. Uh, we actually haven't done a lot of direct selling or, or you know farmers markets or selling to stores or wholesalers like things like that pretty much yeah everything that's everything that's here is already accounted for um but saying that i mean oh sorry carry on i was gonna say so then do your members before they then pay at the start of that year yeah. do they know oh i'm gonna get some for example what you were planting today some yeah. weird and wonderful squash or something like that yeah well we kind of communicate i suppose with them that obviously it's going to change a lot with the seasons and you know as, th as things change through the welsh season and the realities of the Welsh climate and, and growing year, it sort of changes the relationship with your food and it becomes this more exciting journey and, and adventure really into what, what really is realistic for Welsh producers to be feeding people with. So I suppose another way of looking at it would be that you haven't necessarily got kind of like a cash crop or something specifically, but by having, you know, your what, five, six years down the line now, you've got ex examples of things you've grown in the past. Yeah. So it's 
you will get this weird and wonderful mystery box giving you the flexibility to grow what inevitably are in some in other circumstances cash crops you know things that are rare that can sell more if you were to sell them straight to a particular yeah. distributor yeah. but you're just not doing it that way you're having it in this box and that's where people are like yeah. i don't know exactly what i'm going to get but i know that i'm going to get rare things as well as the staples what know. people are buying into is an experience really as much as the food that is in their box um, we try i suppose we try to get away from the idea that the food is a commodity like a product that we're selling for a certain price it's like part of the membership is getting a veg box but there are so many other benefits to being part of it so the other thing i would say for for folks who are not necessarily doing a csa scheme so this might be for you um honey what's it honey honeybee 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 hollow, hollow gardens will okay. will at honeybee so another thing I'd say for you, uh, Will, at Honeywell. <laughs> We've recorded honey this bee. like three. Uh, I'm now hollow. going to put this in. Honeybee honey bee hollow. hollow. And it, Will. Okay. I had to remember Will. Honeybee but... hollow. Honeybee hollow. Okay. Honeybee hollow. Honeybee hollow. <laughs> You're not going to uh, say it like that. <laughs> honeybee hollow. Honeybee hollow. So one other thing I'd say for, for Will at Honeywell. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's a tongue twister. Okay. So now do you even remember what it was, it was that you were so going to say? So, so. Another thing I would say for you, Honey Bee Hollow Gardens, is that um, if you're not doing a CSA or a vegetable scheme um, and you're growing for kind of you know, cash crops for the market, um, in this context, you know, so we're talking about a very human scale, um, you know, human labor based, fixed permanent beds, no dig um, on a relatively small space. You know, you want to be going for the crops that are highest value, right? So you want to be concentrating that, that relatively small amount of space on the highest value crops possible. So one of the ways is what we talked about earlier is intercropping, you know, really using your space to the maximum by getting multiple crops stacked on top of each other. But at the same time, it's thinking about what are the things that, you know, have the highest um, financial return for the amount of space that it's going to use. So, you know, you might think about cabbages. We all love cabbages, but they actually take a huge amount of space in a bed for a really long time and their market value is really low. So that's why historically we haven't grown a lot of those things. Whereas, you know, like depending on where you are, you know, salads, leafy greens can be really high value. You can get a lot of them crammed into a small space. Um, and again, talking about those niche crops, you know, you can grow those niche things that, that really no one else is doing or that you might have, the, you know, you might have the niche in the market for that. So yeah, it's all about weighing up like labor, space, time, money, trying to yeah make make the most efficient use of your garden also you know trying to stay within your within your values and ethics as well as a business i suppose great answer quite um in depth and therefore i hope everyone is okay with this my original plan was that this was maybe going to be five six different questions if each question answer is like 10 minutes <laughs> and especially us getting tongue-tied halfway through then I, so i might only do two or three each time um, but let us know in the comments down below if you're happy with the video being 30 minutes long, 40 minutes long, because we ask five, six questions at the end, um, as opposed to one video at the end, at the end of the year, that's going to be an hour, two hours long, where all those questions get answered. Let us know which one you'd prefer. So Ben, Ben Moffitt, uh, I hope that in this video we've answered your question. So next question comes from Taylor Fries, and they say, I think I would ask about a season schedule. What gets planted after what is harvested? Okay, um, so really hard to say in a comprehensive way without my crop plan in front of me or, you know, with the amount of time that we have. But what I will say is that, so right now, about around this time, we're entering what might be called the second spring. So this is the time when we start sowing the next succession of crops, right? So, um, so we've sown our squash and our sweet corn and our runner beans and things that could kind of fill out the garden uh, for the summer. Uh, but we also need to be thinking now about sowing our wind, our sort of autumn time crops, right? So that's things like um, our Brussels sprouts, um, autumn and winter cabbages. Um, we might be putting in like bulb fennel right now. Um, at the same time, we're like always sowing successions of beetroot, of carrots, of, uh, of swedes, uh, sorry, swedes and turnips, um, spring onions, those kind of things. We're just keeping going all the time as well as salads microgreens, those kind of things. So it's, it's always a toss up between those, those things that are like big sentinel crops that are, you know, taking up a good amount of space in the garden for a long time. Um, and then those things that are successional that don't take too long to come to harvest. And we're just doing those over and over and over again for as long as we have 
the light and the, the temperature. Yeah, we don't really do a, do much of a, a sort of rotational thing in terms of the plant families, that traditional you know approach to veg growing because with no dig, it doesn't seem to be much of an issue. You know, with good soil health and um, all we try and do is not you know not follow a, an allium with an allium or a brassica with a brassica something like that. So all our beds are the same width, right? The 75 centimeters. I think I talked about this in an earlier video. Um, and all we do is look for the, the beds, the place in the garden where we have the space that we need for that crop. And that's kind of how our rotation or our crop planning works. So sometimes we run out of space. Sometimes it can be a real juggle to try and find space, um, especially in the next month or so, we're gonna run out of space really quick. So um, sometimes we find ourselves making new beds just for whatever's in the seed house. Sometimes things don't make it out into the garden. It's just, that's just a reality. It's kind of similar to something you were t talking about earlier on when you have failures. It's not mm. necessarily a failure, it's mm. that you can, and having that almost freedom within your own plan yeah. gives you that confidence and that, uh, you know, empowers you to be like, yeah. to play maybe with, yeah. okay, well, though we've got a space there, let's try something there. And obviously over time and over years that you do it, you also know yeah. um, what works well with other things, what maybe works well in certain areas on the land and uh, in certain soil types and stuff. Yeah. And yeah, that's really, yeah. It's, really it's another point. reason why, thanks. Sure. It's quite Thank nice, actually. It's quite, I'm, I'm learning uh, yeah, we talking podcast, to you. We? Yeah, maybe I should do like a monthly video. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But that's, I mean, it's another reason why I'm such a huge advocate for the CSA model, because again, that, you know, that is a model that really supports a slightly more flexible approach to crop planning and things. Because if you, you know, if you have a glut of something, you know, nobody's going to be disappointed to get a glut in their box or, you know, it's, it's, and essentially you're, you know, people are taking whatever's there. So as long as you have a basic diversity of crops, as long as people get a good amount of items in their box, you know, they're not going to complain. So, Excellent. so I'd really encourage anyone to think about it if you're planning on growing veg for market. Which I think leads us nicely and maybe into Tara's question. Yes, possibly. I did want to say, I'd like to include Tara's question. Yeah. Tara Crank, friend of the channel, someone I was filming with recently for Koi Clow. Hi Tara. Hey Tara. It seems there is a lot of community and connections needed to grow a market garden like this, mm. like volunteers and potential members. How did you build that community network before you have a product to sell? Yep, that's a really good observation, I'd say, Tara. I think, um, you know, the CSA model, you know, I talked a lot about how much I love it and, and, you know, I clearly believe in it, but it's also, it does ask something else of, of the grower or the lead or, who, you know, whoever's leading it or running it, um, which is to put so much more effort into building relationships um, because it is so based on relationships, you know, over seasons with with core members that have been with us for years yeah like you said with volunteers um creating a good volunteer experience is really important for us and we've worked really hard to make the garden not only a productive market garden but also a nourishing therapeutic space for people because you know we have people come here with at various points on their mental health journey and, and experiencing various difficulties and this you know it's really important to us that this is a haven a retreat a place where they feel safe and so you know we have to tread that line between like productive market garden and you know slow gentle like welcoming place for people to be before this existed um and you didn't have already have volunteering or um sort of ongoing members did you have like a set like a set business plan of way in which you were doing things in yeah. regards to finding those volunteers telling them about yourselves when you also couldn't obviously because you hadn't started yet have lovely pictures and videos of yeah. finished product how did you i mean i guess the point that? is it was very slow it was very slow very organic i remember being here you know uh, sometimes just with my sister or or rose who some of you probably know from some other videos she's quite famous from those um and like one you know one volunteer in the first season like, like we just had one guy who came every week for the whole first year, I think. Uh, Nick, shout out to you, first volunteer. Stefan coming on board was a big catalyst. Um, things really started to grow when we started doing, doing it together and, you know, but a lot of it initially was like word of mouth, personal connections, just being out there talking to people. I did a lot of networking in the first few years, a lot of going to events and, you know, um, conferences and like well-being events, things like that. Um, a lot of flyering, those kind of things. I hope hopefully everyone it can add a little bit of um extra example to to this question but 
to give you a prime example of what I'm doing right now, like, so I started a video production company. The way in which we did that at the time was start the company and then go to every kind of business networking event. Yeah. Personally, didn't really like that. A lot of it was a uh, forced 60 seconds, promote yourself, sell yourself. Um, and over time, it did grow and it developed. The way that we've moved to Wales, and my aim is I want to make videos that I, that I enjoy and hopefully, overall, we'll make money in lots of different ways from the land, from the videos, from different things. But instead of doing like a lot of networking um, that's pay us 10 pounds and we will allow you to say your piece in front of a room full of other people who have paid us 10 pounds to say their piece and try and sell their business. The way I'm you know, using this channel is by contacting people, whether it be through YouTube, mm. we're finding them on Google, and basically saying, can we either, can I come and volunteer or can we do something for free? So like, can, can I have some vegetables in return for some photography? You know, if there's, I, I did a video on bartering and this kind of gets into that. And I, th I found that in essence, when you're for free, i.e. money is exchanging hands, but either knowledge, services, or, or food, things like products like food, things that have taken time, being able to swap and secure that, Abel's friends have just turned up. The, everyone involved, I find, is a lot more um, engaged and appreciative of that, um, of everything to do with the process. And most importantly, is much more likely to then pass you on and say when a job does come up, when something comes up. So, for example, you know, by having volunteers, by having people here, if you grow that community, to grow that network that two years later, one of those people that have come and volunteered because they're struggling at the time, have now got a job where they maybe have the resources that they can be and become a member. You know, it's builds that community and it's a much longer lasting and I think sustainable kind of community rather than uh, Facebook marketing. Yeah, it's the difference between trying to create a market and trying to create a community really. And I really like, it brings me back to permaculture and I talked a lot about permaculture on these tours, but it's, it's a design approach really. And it, you know, it can be applied, yeah, to how you design a garden, but it can also be taken up to how you make an organization or how you make a project where you're like, how do I live within those ethics and how do I create something circular that's self, you know, self-sustaining and, and sustainable and regenerative. And it also mimics, you know, the way ecosystems work in, in the sense that like you're sharing resources, it's this like web of connections and, um, and there's a lot of strength and resilience in that. And I think I love, I, like, I love that about this project, about how many relationships it's built on and understanding that there's a reciprocal nature to, to creating a human ecosystem that's really thriving. And I think, yeah, I hope, I hope that that's what we're showing here. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Do you yeah. think so? Okay, I think that's going to be it for today. Let us know if you have any questions. Um, and also, I think I personally like the idea that we've, we've gone into a bit more depth with yeah. these answers. Uh, I say we. You have gone <laughs> into depth with these answers. Um, and hopefully that kind of gives more of a rounded answer than just a very quick, yes, we do uh, those. Yeah. Yeah. So, therefore, let us know again uh, if you also agree or whether you would maybe like some quick for quicker form stuff um or maybe separate videos about completely different subjects mm. and really focusing in on one subject but otherwise thank you again abel but quickly before we go abel's got something very quickly to plug if you're a based around Carmarthen and you want yeah. some amazing yeah so we've grown uh, a load of extra tomato plants um for our community uh to help anyone who might have forgotten to sow seeds or not sown seeds in time um, so we've got a load of um, Gardener's Delight, so that's a cherry tomato variety plants ready to go. Um, they're grown from open pollinated seed, saved here uh, in really lovely worm compost and recycled pots. Um, so really great plants, really great way to start your tomato crop this year. So yeah, get in touch. You can go on our website, they're in the, in the shop on the website, or you can just get in touch directly if you live locally to us here in West Wales. But most importantly, most important, most important, very special message going all the way to New Zealand. Yeah. Who's it for? So for Manaya, my wonderful niece who watches these tours every month. Uh, she's one of our best viewers. And um, yeah, I just want to say I love you. I miss you. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed this month's video. Hi, Manaya. Bye, guys. See you in Hiya. June.
thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, and we'll see everyone next month. Ciao. Cheers, guys. Thank you. You okay, sir? You like a massage? <laughs> I bet that's lovely. Actually. It's really nice. About in a permaculture market garden in the month of May. <laughs> yeah, that's what we need after. Every A bit of affirmation after every really shot. Like Thanks. That. It's getting pretty hot in here. I think I've got an idea. Let's bring the rain. Go, Caitlin. No, no, don't go, Caitlin. <laughs> don't go, Caitlin. Don't go. <laughs>